Hi guys, uh, my name is Tom, and today with me I've got Rubidium. Uh, he's a fellow filmmaker. Thank you, Tom. And uh, he's also actually on YouTube. You guys might recognize him from some collaborations we've done in the past. And I have him here uh, to talk about his latest indie film. Uh, sort of, we'll talk about how I guess he he made the film, but even more interestingly, how he self uh, basically funded and then distributed the film and actually made it profitable. Um, so maybe yeah, you can introduce the film for us. Yeah, uh, so the film is called The Devil's Fortune. The script is optioned by a couple of studios and I had spent like a year in LA trying to attach the right talent that the studio wanted and it was going back and forth and prepping and attaching all this sort of stuff. And after a year and a half, it sort of all it didn't really fall through. It just kind of petered out as the projects like that sometimes do where kind of people just lose interest after a while. And I was tearing my hair out because I'd spent, I'd now spent so long trying to get this project off the ground. And I thought to myself, I should just make it. I should just take the resources that I have, the, the, the gear that I have access to that I can rent or borrow or steal, you know, use locations that um, are freely, freely available or are cheap on um, Geekster and Peerspace, uh, hire the best actors um, that I can, regardless of when or not their names and then try and make the film myself because otherwise I'll be waiting forever. And so uh, we started shooting in April, 2020, which was a bad time <laughs> to make, try and make a movie. Uh, we shot a week, we got shut down. There was a, like a, in LA, there was a stay at home order. Like we couldn't legally keep filming. Um, so then we came back, we modified a lot of the locations so that all the interiors became exteriors. Like we had a scene that was in originally gonna be in a hotel room and we put it at an airport, um, things like that. And then, uh, we shot that was 90 percent of it and then i edited what i had and then we had to go back in november 2020 and shoot one more week so we shot three weeks spaced out over um the year 2020 we spent about a year on post um maybe six months on post of color grade edit mix um, all of which either did myself or you know had friends do or, or like found um you know cheap alternatives to and then I uh, tried to get a distributor and I sort of had a very similar experience with distributors that I had with the studios trying to fund it in that they all wanted it. They all wanted talent or the ones that did um, want to distribute the film weren't going to give me any money up front. They just they wanted the film for 15 years. Uh, they were going to uh, give me 70 percent of the profit, but they weren't going to to really spend any time or effort promoting the film. They were just going to put it up on Amazon, iTunes, Apple, and hope somebody watched it. And I thought that was crazy. And so I distributed it myself. I, you know, put it up on Amazon, on iTunes. I'll tell you, that's how most filmmakers end up going, right? It's because I think most filmmakers don't think about that, that last aspect of distribution. They get excited about filmmaking. And then I know when I did my first was a short film, but I, that's kind of what ended up is a distribution company that just, you know, packets like 20, 30 films. They couldn't care less about my film and they, you know, they, yeah. they write off all these costs and everything. So at the end of the day, you get nothing. Uh, and they just, you know, in the end, they make money, but the filmmakers usually don't, right? Yeah, like they just, you know, some distri the, these digital distributors will put out 300 movies a year. Yeah. And if each one of them makes five grand, they're, they're profitable, but they're not, they're not profitable for the filmmaker, they're only profitable for the distributor. And it creates this, um, it creates this uh, bad situation whereby you don't really want to promote your film or put any money behind promoting it because all the money that the film is then earning is going straight to the distributor, not to you, the person who's paying for the ad. So it creates a situation where you don't want to, you know, advertise your film. Uh, but uh, we, you know, I, I did a small little Facebook campaign to like launch the film over the first 10 days. Let, let me ask you though, like, so when you were starting the project, did you already think of ahead of like, okay, I'm going to probably distribute this on my own or were you? No, I mean, I think we're all kind of, I mean, psychologically, we're all kind of stuck in the nineties where if you make a movie, you know, Miramax or Sony classics is going to swoop in and, and give you $2 million for it. Um, that just doesn't happen anymore. Those those boutique studios or those um, small distributors, they're making their own projects. They're not really buying stuff at festivals. Um, and if they are buying stuff at festivals, they're buying stuff that they already knew was coming down the pipeline. So like for a truly independent filmmaker, like someone who's outside of the Hollywood festival 
system, um, you haven't got a chance in hell, right? Like you're, you're better off. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Like there, there are people out there who want to see your film and there are, there, you have a film to show them, but unless you can make that connection somehow, um, you're ne not going to be able to, to get an audience. Mm -hmm. Since you had to sort of figure it out, I guess, as you went, right? Where the, the, was it a lot of just trial and error? Did you look for some resources? Yeah, I, mean, I mean, is there? I, I mean, you and I both, uh, I have a YouTube channel called The Crimson Engine, which I've been doing for seven, eight years now. And I'm shocked how, how much convergence there is between, you know, YouTube and Amazon. Uh, because a lot of what's happening every night, millions of people sit down to watch a movie they go to they boot up amazon on their laptop or on their smart tv and they cycle through the new releases to see what takes their fancy or what what, what seems interesting to them and they go by the thumbnail the title and if those two things connect with them then they watch the trailer and if the trailer has something compelling to it something new something unknown but it also looks high quality then they'll watch the film and i think that's so so um similar to the process of making a, a good youtube video it's the title the thumbnail and then you know you scroll over it and see something and you click on it so the the same uh kind of discipline the same things that we've learned from uh youtube become really applicable to indie film distribution i think i mean i've seen as i've been watching the the amazon charts um over the past 20 days i think is since the devil's fortune was released you know we were spending a hundred dollars a day on facebook ads and we were you know devil's fortune was in straight away it was in the top 30 thrillers and i've watched all these other hollywood and, and many major films come up through the charts as they're spending money but as soon as they stop spending money they totally disappear whereas devil's fortune has like slowly climbed and climbed and climbed um, through not just the thriller or the action chart, but the, all of the new releases. I think we're number 43 today. Oh, wow, um, So well, maybe, so yeah, it's, thank you. <laughs> let, let's maybe show the trailer then so, so the audience can actually, actually kind of get a glimpse of, uh, of uh, what your film's about, right? Get you the money. Cut a man's head off! I hope we give those people what they wanted. Because if it didn't, they're gonna come looking for you. They found us. All right, so that was Dell's fortune. Uh, so you know what? Before we kind of continue talking about the distribution aspect, uh, maybe you can tell us uh, overall, like when you were. If, I'm guessing when you wrote the script, did you already write it with the budget in mind, kind of knowing in case I need to make it for limited budget? Yeah, yeah, I did. I originally wrote it actually uh, when I was living in New York City, and it was it was like a Wall Street based financial thriller. Um, and, you know, I'd seen that, you know, uh, there are a couple of those like Margin Call, um, Boiler Room, Arbitrage, and they really are just 20 scenes of people in offices talking about money. And if you can make that compelling, that is a very cheap way to shoot a movie because, you know, you can often get access to offices, um, you know, that are either empty or real estate companies um, will, will let you shoot there or almost everyone knows someone who works in an office that will let you film there. So offices are cheap places. Um, and I had written it originally as a, as a movie that could be shot independently over three weeks. And then, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles in, I think, 2015, I then rewrote it for L.A. to incorporate more of things like, you know, downtown L.A. and the, the canyons and the, uh, and the desert and the beach, all the, all the factors, all the, 
the kind of free uh, production value that you can get from Los Angeles uh, and the kind of like mystery and, and, and um, mythos that, that LA contains uh, you know, in that great tradition of like the LA noir thriller. So I'd written it very cheaply, but what's weird is like when studios were interested in it, I then, you know, I punched it up and made it, added car chases and foot chases and added all this more cinematic stuff because that's what they wanted because, you know, they were looking at shooting this for half a million dollars. Um, still super cheap for a, you know, studio film. But then when I had to make it myself, I had to like take that out again. So, I mean, so what was your you know, budget then, your final budget? Uh, I would say without being super specific, uh, it was uh, low six figures. So the actual cash budget, meaning the money we spent, uh, was around $100,000. Now, it was also, you know, four years of my time. So <laughs> even at working minimum wage, that would add another, you know, $200,000 uh, to the budget in terms of um, what I had, you know, what I contributed to it as far as my actual work. And then we got, you know, the cameras for free, the lenses for free, uh, most of the gear, the lights for free, um, all through asking um, the manufacturers or brands to uh, donate or lend us the stuff in return for, you know, giving them content, giving them coverage, uh, publicizing what it is that they do, making tutorials on YouTube. I mean, I could never have made this film so cheaply without YouTube. So, okay, so, okay, that was my next question. Do you think YouTube helped you or having a presence, I guess, on social oh, media? Unbelievably, right? In fact, I think it's kind of the chicken and egg thing because I could never have made this film without my YouTube channel, but I don't think I would have made it if I hadn't had my YouTube channel, knowing that I could, um, that, that this kind of project would ge have generated so much other content for, you know, both publish publicizing, the, publicizing the film and extending what it is that, that I do, um, as, as a, you know, content provider, educator. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. That's a, definitely YouTube helps then. YouTube helps. YouTube, I mean, I think that the stuff has and i mean you're a champion at this on your channel of like making film gear more accessible you know whether it's the camera body the lenses the video assist the tripod lights right like the the um w the actual means of production of shooting a film have become so cheap and so accessible that it's no longer the limiting factor the limiting factor is can you get people to watch the film like do you have an audience do you have a uh, community that you've built around your work to actually watch the film when it's done. That is, I think, is the new, um, that is a new limiting factor. So, okay. So now when it comes to once you've actually produced the film, right, we won't get into too many of the technical things. I'm sure, you know, if people want to find that out, they can, they can go to your YouTube channel. Uh, but once you've get the whole film shot, right, the, and, and then, you know, I'm guessing the post-production went pretty smoothly. Uh, post was you know, long, right? Like, it, it, you know, I'm used to working on, you know, a 10 minute YouTube. Did you do it mostly yourself? I did it mostly myself, yeah. We had an editor who was great. We had a um, sound mixer that I hired on um, Upwork from Greece. And I had a colorist friend who sort of advised me, uh, Jeff at Dungeon Beach, but I actually applied, like he helped me design the looks and then I went through and applied them all to the, to the um, film. So that took a long time because I think there are 1800 shots in the movie. Um, so anytime you do, you do anything 1800 times, it takes a, long, a really long time. Um, and then of course there are, once you've finished the film um, and it's like picture locked, sound locked, then you have all of these other little things that, you know, unless you've gone through the experience, you're really not prepared for. It's all the stuff like um, QC, quality control, where someone has to go through the whole movie and make sure that nothing's too bright, there's no more a, that you, know, that you haven't moved the power windows in DaVinci Resolve too quickly so that they're noticeable. Oh, okay. So then you end up going back through and fixing all of those things. And then, but then what, when, once you've done that, they QC it again and they find all new types of things. So you end up going through <laughs> this endless process. And that was necessary, not so much for Amazon, but for, for Apple, for the iTunes thing. Um, you also need to do, you know, seven or no, I think it was like 14 different posters, you know, the vertical, the horizontal, the horizontal with no text. So there's, you know, like a week's worth of just design. Um, 
and then you need to do subtitles. There's like so many small little things that are just months and months of work to actually deliver a film. But like for the poster, for example, did you already kind of, were you planning while you were shooting the film, like getting stills and stuff? I, I'm lucky that I did because I'm also a photographer. So I had taken all the key art photographs with the actors. In some cases, I took them before the film shot. Oh, okay. uh, the only one that I didn't have, I, I spoke to someone in distribution and they said, if you're going to make a thriller, make sure that the poster has a gun on it, <laughs> which was really good advice because as you're scrolling through and I see it now on other people's posters, it's just like two faces. And yeah. that could be a drama, that could be a romantic comedy, that could be a uh, like a period piece. I mean, unless we've, we're conditioned to say, oh, there's a gun on it, that's a thriller. So I didn't have pictures of that guy. So then I was, but we shot in 4K XFABC. So I was able to go in and actually pull uh, a shot from the movie and put it on the poster, which I don't think you used to be able to do. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, so what camera did you shoot on? Uh, Canon C500 Mark II. Um, I love that camera. Uh, full frame, uh, you know, full frame raw. Did you shoot it raw? We didn't. We actually tested the raw against the XFABC, the 10 bit that the camera has. And the raw was huge because the, the raw has to be 6K off that sensor. Oh, okay. um, you don't have an option, but the XFABC is 4K. So we actually tested it, even the green screen stuff where I where I did um, like green screen for all the car scenes. I tested the RAW versus the XFABC and I, there was almost, almost no, it was imperceivable difference. And so we shot the whole thing XFABC and I'm glad that I did because the, I would have had, you know, terabytes of data otherwise. Yeah. Now, when it comes to distribution, distribution, then when you have to do the final deliverables, uh, is that is that enough? Like, do you need, because I, from what I understand, here's, here's Netflix, something that's insane that I learned. Netflix requires raw, right? Yeah, Netflix. Netflix is weird, right? I haven't dealt with them. You know, they 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 haven't yet accepted my film to to um to distribute. But Amazon won't even accept 4K. They only want a essentially a 1080 oh. ProRes 444. Oh, okay, that's weird because they do have 4K. Same with 4K same with content. iTunes. Um, I think there are there, the studios have some kind of deal where they can do a they can do a 4K with Amazon, but the regular regular films only are being distributed in 1080. Oh, okay. They they just don't want the they don't want the, the hassle and the size. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess the, the the bandwidth and all that starts streaming 4K just in case. Yeah. And once it's once it gets crushed up by the codecs, you don't <laughs> it's, you don't notice anyway. Yeah. I know. I mean, I would probably shoot my next. I wouldn't shoot my next movie 1080, but I certainly wouldn't worry trying to shoot 6K or 8K. Oh, okay. You know, 4K is plenty, and most films are still distributed 1080. Okay. Now, uh, any other like sort of requirements that maybe surprised you when it comes, you know, to uh, to uh, I guess iTunes or Amazon? No, I mean a lot of people told me that we should master in five point one, um, which is a lot more expensive. But Amazon, iTunes, both only wanted um, two point one stereo. Uh, you do have to do uh, for iTunes. You do have to do um, closed captions. Oh, okay. Uh, so you have to have basically have subtitles on the whole movie and it costs like five hundred dollars oh there's all of these little things that cost five hundred dollars like five hundred dollars here five and it adds up to the thousands of dollars i think the thing that most trips most people up is that they get all the way to the end with their last dollar spent so say they have a hundred thousand dollars to make a movie they get all the way to delivery where they like click send and they've spent their their last dollar whereas you actually need to keep a significant amount of money at least ten thousand dollars in reserve to mount some kind of publicity campaign for your film buy ads you know um or else no one's gonna see it what, you you prepared for it right away then like the advertising i mean um luckily um i'm still a working filmmaker um so i've still got jobs coming in all the time and i also uh run canon masterclass which is a um you know online learning destination for Canon cameras, uh, where we have all of these courses and we have, you know, 2000 members that are either subscribers. So they're paying every year or they're, um, or they're buying courses one off like these detailed courses for, for Canon cinema cameras. And so I'm able to, you know, without having to prepare, divert money from Canon masterclass into you know the campaign for devil's fortune uh -huh. how much did you spend then on like once the film was all done and you had the deliverables and then just on the marketing itself i guess well i'm not sure just if that on the have... marketing uh so far yeah. like six thousand dollars so and, and does does that go 
purely like advertising or would it still be some other artwork or things like that? No, I did all the artwork. Um, I think a lot of people will tell you that you should get PR. Um, so you should, you know, like hire a PR consultant to write stories about it and get it, get reviews and get trade, get it in the trades and like, but the problem with that is very seldom. I mean, that used to be the only way to do it before, you know, Facebook and Google and TikTok advertising. Um, but I think now, like I, I've spoken to, you know, I spoke to a ton of people in this industry before I launched the film and the person, you know, a couple of people said, it's just, I mean, it, it used to be that um, you only had one opening weekend and you had to basically get everyone excited about the film. So you had to let them know, you know, four, have four or five impressions on someone through the newspaper, through reviews, through ads, and to, trying to get them to the box office that weekend to make the film a hit. Because if they didn't go the opening weekend, they weren't gonna go. But I think now with, you know, On Demand and Digital, where, you know, the, the, the first window for the film, they call TVOD, Transactional Video On Demand, where you're actually paying, in, in Devil's Fortune's case, $4.99 to watch the movie, that's six months. So you can, um, you know, like buy ads, basically buy ads, make money from those from those ads once you once people start watching the film and then feed that money back into more ads to try and continue that and make the film bigger would you say um, though from your experience so far then is it actually does it really directly translate to like you know the more you spend on the ads the more views you see like do you see a difference there absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean had i not bought ads had i not marketed the film because that's what buying ads is and I had just put it on Amazon and got the, you know, maybe 100 people that I know and were involved in the movie to watch it. Um, and then gone on YouTube and told everyone about it and Instagram, TikTok, and maybe got another couple of hundred buys, right? That would have done almost nothing to, to get people watching the movie. And to, you want, basically want to spend, you, you need thousands of impressions, mm -hmm. um, you know, like thousands of clicks onto the, the, movie and hundreds and hundreds of buys so that Amazon then looks at it or iTunes looks at it and says, oh, this movie's selling. I'm going to start on my own presenting it to people that come to the site. I mean, um, it, again, it's very analogous to YouTube, right? Like you can, you can put out a YouTube video and yes, your subscribers will give it that first kick. But then after your subscribers have watched it and commented and liked it, if, if they do it with high enough frequency, then uh, YouTube itself is going to start putting it in front of people on the homepage. And ju that's just like a, um, movies with Amazon, right? Like once you're on the homepage, it takes off with its own momentum, but you do need that initial momentum to get it moving. So would you say that uh, like social media is basically you're saying social media, at least I guess at the level that we're at, is still not powerful enough as like when you, when you, when you're comparing it to just straight out traditional ads, I guess. Online. I I think that if you um, if you had built a social media presence around one very specific cause, like say you know, save the dolphins, right? And you have millions of people who want to save the dolphins, and then you make a documentary about saving the dolphins, hundred oh, percent, like okay. that will that will absolutely drive views. But if you're like you and I, where you you basically have a social media and community built around independent filmmaking it doesn't follow that all of those people will then want to watch your specific independent film um, unless you actually make one about making a film and then it gets very <laughs> meta. I guess. Um, if you just make, if you're just trying to tell a good story, the audience for that is, you know, hundreds of millions of people. Um, it's so much bigger than the, the specific people you have. So you have to have sort of either a niche or you got to go for the mass marketing then. I mean, I see those uh, yeah Instagram models with like millions of followers. If they promote a movie, where they're in it doing what they do on social media, maybe that will translate. I mean, oh yeah, I can't tell. <laughs> like those OnlyFans kind of uh, models. That's right. <laughs> but well, I guess I mean, that's that, a different that, kind of movie. That's then. a good example because those people are much better off monetizing their following through OnlyFans, right? If yeah, you put some Instagram model in a Hollywood movie for five seconds, how many of the people are going to go watch that movie? Probably not that many. Yeah, I, I would also not, not think that they're like genuine fans i mean they're there for you know mm. in the case of these girls i guess we're, we know what they're there for <laughs> um yeah they're, they're not they don't necessarily turn it, and that's another thing i'll tell you I, I noticed on on social media in general a lot of people have a lot of views 
but they don't necessarily mm-hmm. have a lot of fans in terms w- where they they're actually be committed to let's say support you know a cause or something like that. Speaking of which, like if you guys. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people out there, filmmakers who always talk about like, oh, you know, we should be supporting indie filmmaking. Well, this is your opportunity. So go check out, yeah. uh, you know, your video's <laughs> film. Um, but yeah, but I, I know what you mean. Like if it's, you know, you, you might be a filmmaker, you want to help another filmmaker, but if the topic of the film is not something you're interested in, you're just not going to go see the movie, right? And um, yeah, I mean, I've definitely had a lot of people from my YouTube buy stuff buy courses and enroll in Canon Masterclass right because my YouTube is about filmmaking Canon Masterclass is a product about filmmaking but I'm not expecting you know 70,000 or however many subscribers I have to to 70,000 people to go across and watch The Devil's Fortune they might not like you know dark political espionage thrillers exactly yeah well I'll tell you from my experience uh, I remember like when I was you know years ago when I was a lot more also active on YouTube uh I did, pr- I mean, I, I promoted a bunch of films that I've done, but the one that actually did the most successfully was a, this short film. And it was simply because I was selling uh, a DVD with all these behind the scenes stuff, all this, you know, filmmaking yeah. knowledge yeah. and like tips on of how I created the film. So it wasn't necessarily like in the end, you know, people ask me, you know, did you make a profit on this film? Well, I guess I did. But it wasn't necessarily the film. I mean, literally, I, if that film was 30 seconds, people would still buy it because then there was like five hours of extra filmmaking yeah. stuff. <laughs> and my audience is people who are interested in filmmaking. So I guess, you know, That's you, right. you That's do right. have to be aiming it at the, at the right uh, audience. Now, is it is it a difficult thing to learn? Like, like what, you know, you having gone and kind of done your own advertising through using Facebook, Google Ads and what TikTok and stuff? Yeah, I tried. I know someone who did all of their ads through um, through TikTok, but their movie um, was very young female focused. It was like a like a revenge thriller. Um, but I tried TikTok. I, I upload like I was getting a uh, dollar per click, two dollars per click, um, which is not great. Whereas on uh, Facebook, I was I'm getting like fifteen cents per click. So I'm only paying fifteen cents per click that are going to Amazon. And then, you know, one out of 10 of those people, uh, or one out of, yeah, one out of 10 people, those people are actually buying the film. That's, you know, for every dollar I'm spending on ads, I'm making $2 from Amazon. So it's like, basically, I, I, I've come to see um, movies not as a product you sell, like, you know, like a, a guy who opens a truckload of bananas and is trying to sell his wares. I've come to see films as, almost like machines where you put $1 in and take $2 out or, you know, $1,000 in and take $2,000 out, uh-huh. um, right? Like it, it depends on how wide the um, audience for the film is and how comp- how easy it is to reach that audience and how compelling the, st- the story is, um, right? Like the, we tried a couple different trailers, um, like Amazon, sorry, Facebook lets you upload different variations and then it puts more, mo- more of your money behind the one that seems to get the most um, traction. Oh, okay. So I, th- I cut three different trailers and the one that emphasized the, the Saddam Hussein lost treasure, cursed, um, cursed treasure angle it was by far and away the best. Um, and I mean, if I look on the ad, on the the comments on the Facebook ad, there's all these people getting into politics, being like, <laughs> you know, like Trump, Clinton, Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush conspiracy theories. I mean, people obviously, you know, what I, I came across was people who are like hungry to know more about um, the Iraq War you know the lies that saddam hussein told the where where he's all the billions of dollars that he um squirreled away that he hid uh is and all the people that have died looking for it um so that because that's what that's the plot of the film is like this 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 cursed treasure that saddam hussein had and that these all these people have gone looking for and 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 wound up um dying over Mm -hmm. okay so uh you know thinking of that then do you think it's also important for filmmakers, I guess, when they're even just beginning thinking of their idea of a film or writing the script, to think of topics that, you know, I mean, I guess it's sort of similar to like when you're doing social media, except the problem with the film is you could do a topic that's very trendy, but by the time the film is finished, that could be, you know, all the right. news. So that's why I would say, like, is that something that's worth looking at or more like, just go make the film that you want to make and then think of the way of marketing it that, you know 
I think that um, you really need to tap into why the film speaks to you. Like, why are you making the film? Why did, why did this idea capture you and make you sit down and write the script, raise the money, find the actors, right? Like, you have to, I think uh, too many times I see people who um, make a film and then produce a trailer or a title or a poster that's just straight down the line, generic, you know, a dude with a gun and a girl, but there's nothing to separate it from what Hollywood's making and Hollywood is spending way more money than we ever could on it. So I think what indie filmmakers need to do is be really clear about what makes your film different, what makes your film compelling, why why people would want to watch it, why, and that should be the same reason you made it. Um, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to bury the lead and hide what really makes your film Different. So, uh, did you spend a long time then doing the, the I guess, the marketing stuff, mainly the, the trailers? Was that a big process? Uh, I, I cut a bunch of different trailers, and I would show them to people. We would test them. Um, you know, like I look back on the first trailer I cut that I thought was awesome. I think it's probably still on YouTube, and I look at it now and I'm like, what was I thinking? It's <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> so I guess you know, I I really do like trailers. I used to cut them for fun, like you know, take lots of different shots from different movies. And I've probably seen almost every trailer that's ever come out. Um, I think they're a really great way to encapsulate a story and to, to tell a story just with images and, and like one or two lines of dialogue. So for me, they're like pure filmmaking. Um, and I think I've definitely got better at them. And I think uh, had uh, the, the thing that is super frustrating is the delay in the data. Like when you launch a YouTube video, you know within an hour how it's doing, who's watching it, who's liking it and if it's if it's how it compares to other things but amazon and itunes are you know they say we're going to update you every day but then da you only get data after weeks you know oh, okay. literally like, had we had we been having this conversation two weeks ago i still wouldn't have known if the film was at all successful i mean i can see it going up and down in the in the amazon um, new releases chart i can see where amazon is pushing it but until i actually got the correct data from amazon i had no idea whether or not we're actually selling anything. So how, how successful is it then right now? Like, because I know you're still in the middle of it. You're, you're still, you know, I guess uh, it's, it's fairly, I mean, you released it, what you said, what, a few weeks ago, right? Yeah, uh, two and a, three and a half weeks yeah, ago. Okay. Um, so how is it going? It's, it's great. It's doing, you know, hundreds and hundreds of streams a day. So at $5 each, that's thousands and thousands of dollars a day, okay. um, which is way more than we're putting into it advertising wise you, so you feel confident you're gonna make your money back and a profit i mean we'll we'll be we'll be in the black uh by the if this continues by the end of next month oh okay. um which is you know and we and after this after the you know this is only one window in you know in north america so after this we have SVOD, so potentially a Netflix Hulu deal for a year. And then after that, AVOD, which is the Tubi and like Freevium and all the um, ad supported content. Huh. So like you make money with your film over years. And to be, you know, like once we're, once we're in the black, uh, all of that is pure profit. And I'm not sharing it with the distributor. It's coming straight to me. The, the, you, people should know though that um, you split your profits with Amazon 50-50. So oh. iTunes, it's 70, 30, right? iTunes only takes 30%, but um, they're not nearly as big as Amazon. Amazon takes 50%. But if you're making money for Amazon, Amazon will make money for you. Like I said, if I'm spending $100 a day on, on, um, on Facebook ads, pushing project, I, I, I'm gonna, I feel like I'll easily get the cut that I've given back to, Am them giving to Amazon back from them in the fact that they'll start pushing it to other people or for those of like people out there who might be wondering like how how do you even get your film up on amazon or itunes is that a complicated process you can uh, itunes you have to go through an aggregator um uh, i used bitmax but amazon and tubi you can uh upload directly actually oh, okay. yeah you can either choose to set a price um so you know it's for amazon like you can do anything from like 199 uh, to rent to you know to twenty dollars to rent you know some of the the movies like um uh what's it called nope you know the jordan peele one right it, it came up on amazon for twenty dollars while it was still in theaters and is it like you create um, an amazon affiliate like like an account is that kind of how it works 
it, it's a whole different uh it's a whole different it's like an Amazon distribution deal okay. you just you create an account it's linked to your existing amazon account and then you they start you start uploading stuff um, but uh, the other option apart from actually setting a price is to just put it for free on amazon prime and then amazon start paying you uh per uh per view i think it's 50 cents per hour watched or something like that um so there are if you you know um that's it that's usually people do the the money first like the tva transactional video on demand and after that they do subscription video on demand where you know um where you can actually it just it, your your movie will be free with prime and then you get paid per per hour watched seems pretty straightforward i mean you know at the end of the day i guess you just gotta stick to it it's a learning curve yeah it's a learning curve for sure but um it's uh right like i i find it very empowering i would much rather be doing it myself and making the mistakes and, and correcting than i would you know emailing some distributor being like are we making any money every six months they give you a statement yeah and they're like no still no money no, no, you definitely <laughs> went the right way because i mean i'll tell you from my own experience years ago uh which was sort of at the time when we I guess we were s slowly transitioning into people doing self-distribution, but still wasn't all there. Like we didn't have all these ways, have all these ways where you could directly sell to a distributor, like let's say Amazon. And I remember it was yeah. a nightmare. And uh, the the few films that I did sell with a distributor, I mean, basically at the end of the day, they made money and I, I made nothing or very little. Uh, so so that was my I guess sort of as a filmmaking journey, you know. That was my sort of uh, lesson learned. And then since then, I was just distributing stuff on my own and and um, never had to distribute a feature film yet on my own. But I feel like uh, having heard like and seeing it, how you've done it, I feel like it's definitely, uh, you know, something that, that it's, you know, any filmmaker now not only uh, can do it, but I, I guess should learn how to do it. Because otherwise, if you're at the mercy of, of these big distributors, you're really not going to make anything. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's very democratizing. I mean, I always see that movies are always like a couple of years behind music, right? You see the, the, the recording, the, the labels and the, the big recording studios and, you know, used to control production, right? No, only, only they could, could pay for the, the, the facilities to record music and then distribution and promotion. All of that stuff was like all locked up and artists were like trapped to these, you know, multi decade recording contracts and saw very little. And now, you know, you have some kid make a hit song, upload it to Spotify, and it's, he's just getting, he's just getting checks in the mail uh, or SoundCloud or whatever it is. And he doesn't need a label. And I think that slowly that same thing is happening with, um, with film and that it's, it's not, super like it's still complicated and it's still involved um but you know in a perfect world you would you know finish your film upload it you know have a have a um like a button that people click to pay you five dollars or a dollar to watch it and and it would go straight through some of the comedians actually big comedians are doing that like i know louis ck and and a bunch of other guys have like have their comedy specials now and you you go to their website and pay five ten dollars to watch it and so like that there's no there's no middleman it's like straight from the artist to the consumer um we're not quite there and well, in fact but, but amazon do you think is, we'll ever be know, there where like like because i mean you know in the case of these comedians i mean they already have huge followings right that's, so that's right. the thing i mean but if, if you're a filmmaker who's not in the business of or you know, have no interest at all in building a media social media presence and all that stuff you just you just want to concentrate on making a film once you have that film i guess it is great then to have platforms like amazon you know, or iTunes were, yeah. they and, already and have. And and Freebie and like all the ways just to get it out into the world. Yeah. I don't wake up in the morning and like want to make YouTube videos, but I realize that if I want to make movies, I have to provide, you know, uh, have a community and an audience around them. Um, and that social media is at this point the, the by far the most accessible and actually forces you to always be asking questions, always be finding solutions to problems and sharing those problems. Um, and I think that is a really healthy way to go about making, making films. So you're saying social media presence is, is a, is a must or a big advantage. It's not, I mean, it's the way that you and I have found, um, to, to make a difference and be able to support the type of movies that we want to make. Um, you know, like I'll I know a lot more on my next film, of course. Um, and I'll on YouTube and on kind of masterclass, I'll, I'll share what I've learned. 
that I learn as I go. Um, you know, there was nothing out there when I was making Devil's Fortune that took you through this distribution process because it's still evolving, right? Like you certainly can't learn this in film school. The people who are teaching in any film school have no idea about this, right? Because they're, they spend their days teaching. They don't spend their days making and distributing independent films. So um, it's really it's really a case of you you gotta you gotta do it or you've gotta learn from someone who has. So are you gonna be sharing them more stuff? I guess as you go through this journey of self distribution. Yeah, I'm gonna put a. I already have a couple of courses on Canon Masterclass. Um, you know, writing, uh, developing a feature film, uh, funding a feature film, pre pro, and putting up production. After that, I'll do post-production and distribution. So I'll do like a whole hour long, multi-hour course about all of this stuff. And where, where can people find it? And Canonmasterclass.com. It'll be up in a couple of months. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. All right, you came prepared. <laughs> I didn't even know you, you're after that. All right, well, you know what? It was great talking to you. Uh, you know. You too, Tom. Thank you so much. Hopefully, they, they, you know, your film keeps on being more and more and more successful so you can do more films. I'd uh, love to see some more. Yeah, work. I mean, the, the big reason that I want to talk about it is that it just it's just so possible, right? Like people, I know so many talented filmmakers out there who are, you know, like can't find the right producer or can't find the right money or can't get their script picked up. It's like by the time you've, you've spent years through that process, you could probably have made the film yourself. And I think a lot of people know that, but what they don't know is they can actually distribute the film themselves and and do it profitably. So that's that's my main, that's what I wanna share. It's like, things are changing, it is possible. You can not just make money from the film that you're making, but then use the profits from that to make the next one and not have to answer to anybody. Be, be you know, make the film um, without uh, any compromise. So be basically a true indie filmmaker, I guess. Independent, totally independent. All right, well, I'm going to put a link down to your YouTube channel, your website, all that stuff. Uh, if you guys want to check out uh, your readings, like, you know, uh, follow up with, with the masterclass, but also uh, if you want to watch this film uh, and all that stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll have you back in the, in, the, in, the, you know, in the future so we can talk more about uh, maybe this project or some other projects you might be up to. Love to. Anyways, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for having you guys here, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.